I'm Connie Crawford, and um, I teach theater here in um, the theater arts uh, department at Brown. And I also direct in the Rights and Reason Theater in the Africana Studies Department. And um, I'm a privileged person who uh, grew up with horses. And as an adult, I'm lucky enough to be able to re-examine and have new relationships with horses. And so thanks for coming to our talk today. Horse Sense will be sh uh, joined soon by Kari Weil and Maddie Butcher. And here's the three of us with our friends. Uh, Kari Weil, it's not Chase, it's Cash, is the one on the left. Maddie Butcher and Barry. And that's me and Moxie. And uh, before we begin our talk, Horse Sense, we just want to say welcome to our audience here in the Martinos Auditorium in the Granoff Center at Brown University, as well as to our virtual audience. We're glad you're here for Reexamining Conservation, presented by the Brown Arts Institute and Creature Conserve. The complete schedule can be found on the symposium website or on the QR code posted out front. So I'm here because uh, when I was young working with horses, I thought it was about domination and conquest, had to be tough. And when I look back at how I treated them, it was abusive. And I, again, I'm lucky enough as an adult, I found a new way of working inspired by a great horseman named Tom Dorrance. And so I work to be a better horse person, it makes me a better human. And um, I do workshops, or I used to before COVID, with horses and humans, like horses and actors, horses and medical students, medical practitioners, and horses and other people. And um, I've written articles, published an eclectic horseman. And today, uh, we are going to, uh, I'll be here in person, obviously, and Kari and Maddie are going to join us virtually um, in just a minute. So I'll just, a little bit more about our program here. Please take time to explore the art exhibit, which is here in the Cohen and Atrium galleries. There's some beautiful um, work done. And there's also a curated reading room on level two of the building. And the books um, from a lot of the writers, Kari and Maddie are writers. And there, um, the Brown Bookstore is offering a 20% discount on the purchase made between now and tomorrow, so hurry. And thanks to everybody who's made this possible, including Italia Field, the faculty director of the Brown Arts Institute, the staff of BAI, the Creature Conserve team helmed by Dr. Lucy Spellman, the Animal Studies Group at Brown, and to the Tomaquag Museum's Indigenous Empowerment Network, who's been working in, conjunct in conjunction with Creature Conserve. On this, on this exhibition in efforts to further amplify the voices of the indigenous community here in Rhode Island. So now uh, let's bring in Kari and Maddie, if you would, please. Bear with us. Anyway, up there you see little squares <laughs> with uh, Kari Weil. Kari, would you wave and say hello? Hello, hello. Great. Kari is a horsewoman, a teacher, and a writer. And you're joining us from Connecticut. And uh, Maddie Butcher, Maddie, will you wave and say hello? Hey, from Colorado. Yay, Colorado. Maddie is a horsewoman, a journalist, and she's the executive director and founder of Best Horse Practices. And uh, thanks for coming from afar. Thanks to the technical team for making this happen. So today, the three of us, um, we're going to start by looking at horses. And, and our prompt is, how can we look at them with more consideration? How can we decolonize the human perspective and look at them for who they are? And um, so we'll look at horses. And then uh, the three of us will share a, just a little bit about our work with horses and our art forms and our human growth. So we're going to challenge and examine how humans see horses in visual images, read about them in print, and how we deal with them in live interactions. So um, right now, we're going to um, talk about, we're going to look at an image together. 
because one of our practices, well, one of my practices is how can I, human beings don't see detail very well. Horses see everything in detail. And so we often judge, or I used to punish my horse for spooking at something, but I didn't see it, they did. So to honor the horse's genius and to try to reach toward an understanding in order to help them have a better life in their captivity, um, I, as a human, need to practice seeing and seeing detail. So we're gonna look at a photograph of a great horseman named Tom Dorrance, and I'm gonna ask you if you would, try to note details. Don't judge, just look at facts. What do you see? And Maddie, can you tell us just a little bit about Tom Dorrance? Thanks, Connie. I would say that Tom Dorrance, along with his brother, Bill Dorrance, and Ray Hunt, uh, which is featured here too, are widely acknowledged as being the forerunners and the pioneers of uh, a new, uh, really a paradigm shift in horsemanship that started when they uh, were working horses um, decades ago. And that paradigm shift is from, you know, the domineering that you mentioned, Connie, uh, to uh, more of a partnership. Um, and so that image there is of Tom uh, working with a horse out in Cal California, I imagine. Thanks, Maddie. And you'll notice his quote, observe, remember, compare. And by all accounts, he was a genius. And so if you would look at this photo, what do you actually see? So when I look at it, one of the things I see is he's wearing a Western hat. Anybody? I'll repeat. He's putting on a saddle. He's putting on a saddle. And the saddling is a very hot stress event for a horse. You're strapping leather to the back of it, cinching it up. Mountain lions will often jump from trees onto a horse's back. So it's very stressful for a horse. What other facts does anybody notice? Yeah, there's a cloth under so that that leather doesn't rub the fur. Good. What else? The uh, seam seems to be fenced in. It's fenced in. Yes. That's important. This horse is freer than most domestic horses, but it is not free. Notice the horse's mouth is open. And I can understand that this horse is yawning because also if you notice its back left leg is relaxed. A horse who's ready to run will have both legs under them. So that with the yawning tells me this is a relaxed horse. Notice there is nothing on its head. He is not holding it physically. That horse could walk away at any time. The halter is actually hanging on the fence. So what this says to me is this is a moment in time, if I actually see, um, this is a moment in time where a horse is in duress, but their perception of their human horse interaction is more relaxed than is common. And one of the things that Tom said is, um, when I say I want the person to think of the horse as a horse, some people might think that isn't much, but I'm trying to bring out that that horse is really, really something special in his own uniqueness. I'm trying to stress the importance of the horse, of really seeing that horse as a horse, seeing what he is and his potential. I try to operate from where the horse is. And as Maddie said, this is a um, shift. And um, okay, great. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a video. If you, oh, I, I'm in charge of the slides. <laughs> I am dominant. This is, uh, we'll watch a short video, and this is um, a documentary about uh, Ray Hunt. Ray Hunt was a, uh, like me, he started off being pretty rough with horses, then he studied with Tom Dorrance, and he became a great advocate for a better relationship. This is from a documentary about him, and you will hear his voice in the beginning. 
Then you're going to see footage of a man in a western hat loading a horse into a horse trailer. That is not Ray Hunt. That is not Ray Hunt. And at the end, you will see Ray Hunt's face. So just so you know, we're going to show some video today that's it's going to be rough, some of it, OK? That's the reality of most horses' lives. Um, but if you're uncomfortable, you can look away during the video or you leave whatever, but just so you all know. So we'll just watch this video. Have you ever seen a fly land on a horse and he shakes his hide? And here we're pulling and knocking and pounding like he has no feelings. He just has to do this job for you somewhere or the other. He's more or less, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not like you or I would work together. He's more of a way down on the totem pole. He's more of a slave to us. And I'm trying to relieve him of this. I, I don't think he has to be a slave to us. And it isn't going to change, but I'm going to work on it. I've helped the human, I've helped the horse. If I've helped the horse, I've helped the human. Great. Okay. So Kari, uh, Kari Ryle is a university professor of letters of the environment and feminist, gender, and sexuality studies at Wesleyan University. She's the author of Precarious Partners, Horses and Their Humans in 19th Century France, Thinking Animals, Why Animal Studies Now, and Progeny and the Denial of Difference, and numerous essays dealing with human-animal relations and theories of animal difference. Her current research explores the legacies of animal magnetism in 19th and 20th century theories of affective influence, tactility, physiological methods for sensing and healing traumatic memories in humans and non-humans alike. So welcome, Maddie. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Kari. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Kari. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Am I okay? Okay. So I want to begin by thanking uh, the Creature Conserve team. Unfortunately, I can't see you. I want to thank Maddie and Connie for inviting me to join you. And I'm honored to be there. Uh, sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, I'll begin by saying that I've been a lover of horses and an aspiring rider since I was a very young kid. Um, and when I first watched the video you just saw and heard Ray Hunt speak about treating horses as slaves, I was reminded of an incident. It was actually an academic conference where I was asked how, as a person involved in animal studies, I could continue to ride and whether or not um, putting a, I just see somebody, um, how I could continue to ride and whether or not putting a bit in the horse's mouth was not like putting shackles on a slave. I responded then, no, I don't believe so but that was about all I said. I didn't really have a ready answer, although I knew of what had already been called the dreaded comparison between human and animal slavery. It was a comparison made already in the 18th century when the Swiss philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, this is my first quote. Yeah, uh, um, quote, I can't, quote. this isn't working to get the next slide. Could somebody do that? Oh. Thank you, here you go. Thank you. Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote, it is neither for slaves nor for tamed horses to reason about freedom. They only know their broken state. Broken is a term I don't use. I prefer educated 
and I will say why. Of course, I know that while, that while bits like whips can be instruments of abuse, I know that I've come to think of them for myself as something like a pen we would put in a child's hand mm -hmm. to learn how to write. For me, bits are instruments of training and training is a way to develop a language between a horse and a rider, one with which we can ask them, perhaps not about their freedom, an abstraction which we, by which you, we humans are often deceived, as Franz Kafka's ape once said, then uh, if, if not about freedom, then about what they can and will learn with their human and so ask them about the work we too can accomplish together. Questions about who has language, about what language is, does, and can be, have been central to my academic work. Um, uh, have been central to my academic work. My life as a professor of literature. And it was reading first the poet and animal trainer, Vicki Hearn, that showed me that questions about language and horses in particular, um, uh, that showed me these questions were also integral to training and working with horses. From then on, uh, my love for animals in general and horses in particular also became an academic interest. Hearn writes about training as a language, not the language we, treat, we teach chimps, and which often consists of putting a particular sign or signifier together with a particular meaning or signified. Rather, language for Hearn is, as the quote so, so, a way for its speakers to travel somewhere together. The integrity of a language, she writes, is the physical, intellectual, and spiritual distance talking enables the speakers of that language to travel. Training, in other words, is a way to give horses or dogs the tools with which to enter a relationship in which they too can speak, not merely react. It is a way to recognize that they too have something to say, even though we may not always understand them. This is why good training must also be a learning experience for the human as well, one that enables us to develop new capacities for listening, for hearing, and above all for feeling, as well as for tr translating these thoughts um, into our words, realizing that our translations may not be perfect. The difficulty of course is that horses and humans are unequally endowed in, in terms of our communicative and sensorial abilities, whether visual, oral, or kinesthetic. The riding relationship depends upon the very senses of touch and feel that have been most disparaged by humanist prejudice. Because of this, riding can challenge the very ground of uh, the grounds of an animal human hierarchy by revealing our shortcomings, our human shortcomings, both physical and intellectual. We may distinguish horses in terms of temperament, of movement, of honesty, sneakiness, <laughs> but they know us and our emotions in ways that we may never understand and often never know. This is why the philosopher Stanley Cavell once suggested to Vicki Hearn that horses might stand as a rebuke to our will to remain obscure. Horses read us through our skin and muscles. And in order to ride and to train well, we must learn to hear and read them through their skin. We saw in the film how a horse can react to a fly. And as Vicki Hearn also wrote, every twitch, this is the next slide, every twitch of the body will be a loud symphony to the horse. I remember many years ago when a young woman at my barn had been hurt in a car accident and asked if I might be open to exercising her horse for her, a very highly skilled and beautiful Oldenburg horse, as I recall. I was thrilled. But I remember that the first time I rode this horse, I think, um, that whenever I tried to ask for the canter, 
the horse went into a passage, a very high stepping trot. I tried to ask again and still got a passage. And then as if the horse knew exactly what I was asking for, he moved his body in such a way as to thrust my legs and seat into the correct position to ask for canter. And then we cantered off. <laughs> this is how you need to ask me, he was telling me. And so I learned. Some of you may have heard the story about the horse Clever Hans, or what in scientific studies of horse intelligence became known as the Clever Hans fallacy. Hans could perform Hans became famous in Berlin in the late 19th and early 20th centuries for a remarkable feat. He could perform addition, or so they said. His trainer, Wilhelm von Austin, would ask him how much two plus two or five plus six was, and Hans would tap out the answers with his hoof. But it was another student at the Psychology Institute at the time who determined the whole thing was the hoax. Hans could not add, but the hunt horse cannot do math. But what Hans could do was far more impressive if discounted as cheating at the time. For Hans would read the bodies of whomever was asking him the questions such that he, was he would tap his hoof in continuity as the head and trunk of the human leaned in and watched him with mounting tension. And then suddenly Hans would stop his tapping when the tension was released the human body returned to its stator stance, straighter stance, indicating that the correct number of top taps had been performed. This then is one example of how well the horse could read cues from his humans, cues moreover, and this is the most amazing part, that Hans's trainers didn't even know they were giving. Indeed, as the Belgian, Belgian historian of science, Vincien Desprez explained, and this is the next uh, slide. What Hans did was even more remarkable than was realized. She writes, yes, it was a beautiful case of influence, but it was moreover a wonderful opportunity uh, to explore a fascinating question. Indeed, the horse could not count, but he could do something more interesting. Not only could he read bodies, but he could make bodies be moved and be affected and move and affect other beings and perform things without their owner's knowledge. And as Desplay further explains, Hans's greatest talent was to be able to switch from one sense, kinesthesia, which is reading the human through skin and muscles as horses generally do, to another sense in order to read visual signals. This was why he was truly talented. The story of Clever Hans has much to tell us, I believe, about human horse relationships and training more generally. For as Desplay insists, who influences whom is a question that does not have a clear answer. This is why training is and must be what Donna Haraway would call a becoming with, a relationship in which horse and human are open to each other open to be affected and moved by each other, open to learn from each other. Moreover, no horse and no human are exactly the same in their capacities to speak and respond or to affect and be affected. And so each training experience is a new one. And in each horse, each experience, horse and rider become something or someone they weren't before, discover hopefully a new profound joy in partnership. What or who that joy is, we may not be able to put into words, just as there may not be adequate words for what we feel from a horse, mm -hmm. to be sure. And this is what much of my research comes up against. Words often stand in the way, in the way of getting to know a horse on their terms and so of traveling the distance together. This I believe is why the philosopher and ecologist David Abrams has said that the more he spoke of animals, the less he was able to speak to them. Mm. This of course is not to de deny the fact that as we ride or train the horse and human alike, 
the, the, as we ride or train, horse and human alike are always speaking and responding to each other in some fashion. Understanding this kind of language, this body language, what might also be called biosemiotics, I believe, can also help bring us to a larger, more ecological view of ourselves as one of many creatures in the world, a world in which we are not the we only make volume. makers and interpreter of signs, for we too are being read and interpreted by those other creatures that surround us, often without our knowing. We rarely pay attention, rarely listen to the many voices out there to hear what they are saying. And we rarely stop to think what it is we might be saying to them without intending or knowing to, or without intending to or knowing that we are saying anything. Working with horses can, I think, begin to open us to the many voices that are out there, begin to make us aware of the many ways that other creatures, flies to horses, are saying something and have something to say, something we should learn how to hear and how to respond to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kari. <laughs> thank you, Kari. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Maddie Butcher. So Maddie is a graduate from Brown University, and she graduated with an independent uh, study in English and biology and a Bachelor of Arts in biology. Maddie worked for nearly two decades as a freelance reporter for the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, and many other publications, covering sports, travel, business, front page, and investigative work while raising three sons. She is the author of three books, including Horsehead, Brain Science and Other Insights, and her latest, uh, Beasts of Being, Partnerships Unburdened. She founded and is executive director of the Best Horse Practices Summit, a nonprofit organization which conducts an annual educational conference. She lives in southwestern Colorado and occasionally writes of life in the rural west for the Washington Post. Maddie is particularly curious about the horse-human relationship, historically and pragmatically nowadays. How can these species help each other, and especially, how can we elevate the horse's best interests as they have elevated ours over the centuries? So, Maddie, when you're ready, would you like me to start the slides now, Maddie? Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, and thank you, Kari. That was fantastic. And thank you to Brown and to Creature Conserve for including me in this conversation. The horse as a species can be so mystical and magical. I think it's easy to get lost in ideas around how we connect with Equus cabalis. We can spend a lot of time in our heads and with our heads in books, can't we? Uh, indeed, my work as a journalist and a conference director and a horsewoman all stems from an idea that Dr. Franz de Waal, a primatologist at Emory University put forth years ago. He said that in order to do right by another species, we must know it intimately. And I think this gathering is about doing right for this planet's other species. Uh, so I thought I'd describe a bit what that might look like for horses. It means learning about anatomy, digestion, physiology, neuroscience, and herd dynamics. It means learning about management, biomechanics, conditioning, and nutrition. It means getting dirty. It means learning how to trailer horses, how to tie a quick release knot. It means that when it's dark and you still have miles to go, that you drop the reins and let your horse take you home because he savvies the way better than you do. Knowing horses intimately, I've found, involves work that is physical and ultimately intuitive. Virtually all of it is away from my desk and out of my scholarly head. It, it involves, I think, a lot of fence sitting and a lot of time in the saddle. 
A horseman I know told me years ago that watching someone train a horse is like watching paint dry for some people. Or maybe I think it might be like watching a baseball game for someone who doesn't know baseball, in which there's so much going on on a very subtle level that for an untrained observer, it would be dull and boring. Horse work and horses, I think Connie and Kari would agree with me here, are not dull and boring. There are about 4 million horses in the US now. They exist in our fast moving society in which we fly in planes, we get places quickly, we accomplish tasks quickly, we have apps and drugs and clubs for doing things and getting what we want. Yet we are not necessarily healthier and happier than we were 100 or 200 years ago. Research shows that what we've been shedding is valuable, even essential to our well being. Time outside, time with animals. They are key factors in crafting a vibrant life. And not surprisingly, these things have everything to do with a life with horses. Studies show that horses may be the most effective feel-good animals out there. Indeed, the number of horse-related therapeutic centers is steadily increasing. This growing community is helping to successfully repurpose horses from beasts of burden to beasts of being. What we horse owners know as horse time is rebranded here as equine therapy, equine assisted learning, equine facilitated therapy, and so on. These entities have discovered what we riders and owners have always known, but perhaps taken for granted that hanging out with horses makes us feel good. I think there are two reasons why this is so. Um, so those of you on Zoom and in the audience, uh, close your eyes and imagine you're standing by a horse with one arm draped over its back. Listen to its breathing. Place your face in its mane and smell that sweet musky scent. Feel the heat radiating from its thousand pound body. Put your ear to its belly and listen to the incessant gurgling. Watch those eyes and ears. The ears swivel independently and one might be on you while the other might point toward the wind. Those eyes are the biggest in the mammalian world and the horse's field of vision is expansive, about 300 degrees. If you let yourself, it's easy to become immersed in the horse's presence. And that's the point, right? The immersion is therapeutic. Y'all can open your eyes now. <laughs> the second explanation for what horses offer us is that engaging with them for any prolonged period of time becomes an earned partnership. With horses, we learn about respect, trust, consistency, boundaries. It's a relationship that's challenging to obtain and to maintain, and it's very much a two-way deal and therefore has great value. These qualities of horse time make it more effective than gardening or listening to music or scores of other activities that are marketed to address one's well being. That recognition and the growth of horses as effective therapists is not unlike that moment 5,500 years ago when some folks in what's now known as Kazakhstan considered domestication and the riding of horses for the first time. But when can, sorry, but when we say we want horses in our world and in our future world, what does that look like? How can we make it worth their while? What can we offer them? I think these are the questions we're considering within this symposium. As I said, we owe it to horses to know them intimately, and we should use that knowledge to set them up for success in every way. Practically speaking, here are a few examples of what that looks like. We're not putting them in stalls. We're not isolating them. We're not giving them grain or feeding them three meals a day. In other words, we're not anthropomorphizing. We're not thinking about what's best for us humans. Since we know them intimately, we should know how to treat them like horses. 
Horses need to be in a herd. They need to move and graze most of the day and night. Freedom, friends, and forage are priorities for Equus cabalis. Since they are nonverbal, we need to study what they're saying with their bodies. They respond well, for instance, to negative reinforcement, also known in horse circles as pressure and release. This is like me stepping into your space and you taking a back step. This is how horses move each other. And we can see that in some of the videos Connie has featured. Um, and it's how we can effectively work with them. When my friend said that good training is like watching paint dry, it's because those trainers have learned to be very quiet and subtle with their asks or their cues. So the pressure, for instance, might be an inch of lean towards the horse and the release might happen as the horse thinks about changing direction. You might notice a horse's shift in mindset by way of an eye blink or a softening of its jaw. And the more you know, the more you see in what is a fascinating cross-species dance. The more you know, the better you can get along with these thousand pound animals and the better you can advocate for them. The book, The Body Keeps the Score by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk was instrumental in helping me understand how trauma and stress can be stored and manifested in our bodies. So too with horses, it may not be surprising for you to hear that a lot of horses has tra have traumas and stresses of their own because of injuries, physical and mental, that for the most part, humans have inflicted on them. They can tell us a lot about how they're doing if we are observant and listen, and if we know what to notice and what to pay attention to, how they behave, how they move, how they react to us, healing can happen for them too. Another important issue when, our, when considering our future with horses is what we bring to them with each and every interaction. What do they think of us? How do they consider us? To answer these questions, I think, I think us humans need to know ourselves intimately. We are finding that the most successful horse-human connections are made by owners and riders who recognize horses' sensitivities and are supremely mindful of what they, the humans, bring to the barn or the arena on any given day. Are you stressed? Are you nervous, angry, braced, unconfident? Horses feel that from a hundred yards away. I believe that when we do the hard work of being cognizant of our own energies and emotions, then we can more effectively communicate across species. When we listen more and talk less, we can more effectively communicate across species. It's often a matter of letting go of our humanness, of our busy brains to get to what matters. These are some of the reasons why I think horse work is so fascinating and multifaceted. This is why they deserve to be part of the conversation and having a handle I think on our part or impact of any interspecies interaction has everything to do with the conservation and perpetuation of our fellow animals on this planet. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Maddie. Am I good with the mic? Great, thanks tech people, being hybrid, excellent. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how most of us observe horses, which is in images, statues, and in film and TV. And again, some of the footage might be tough to watch. It's tough, tougher for the horses. So I want to talk about, I come from a performance background. I was an actor and have done, I teach acting here. And um, so I often think when I'm watching a film or a TV that for the horses, it's a documentary. It's not fiction. They think it's real. And Clint Eastwood tells this story when he made westerns, he noticed that when, the, when they would do multiple shots and the horses were getting ready, they'd get all jazzed up. And when the director would yell, action, hard and loud, the horses would, you know, ah. 
And so he, when he uh, uh, directs humans, he always goes action, which I, you know, that's a good thing, I think. Um, but I want to just talk about, we'll look at some video, and um, I want you to, well, we'll think about, well, let me do this first. So this is well, one of the first um, films made. This horse is running, notice its mouth is, is relaxed, its whole body is moving. This was, I think, 1870s. This is the Mirror Bridge film of an actual horse running. And so we're going to look at some of the ways in which horses uh, are in trouble. These are two images we live with here at Brown University. On your left is the Marcus Aurelius statue on campus. And yes, the students put a mask on him. And um, notice that both of these horses have their mouths open in response to pressure from the riders. One horse, the Marcus Aurelius horse, his, he's, got, he's so tight this way that he's got wrinkles. The horse on the right is from the a brochure that the Hay Library had. It's a, a painting of a British soldier in the Sudan in 1890s. Notice that horse has his mouth open, but his head's up. Those are two ways that horses try to avoid the pressure in their mouths from the rider. A bit like Kari was saying, the bit itself, the metal that's in its mouth, is not bad. It's how it's used. So if, you all want, if anybody wants to open your mouths all the way and put your head up, how does that feel? And now tuck your head down with your mouth open. So that's mostly what we see. And we're going to watch a video uh, from a TV show in the 60s. Count how many times you see the horse's mouths open in response to the riders. This is Kit Carson, this kind of TV shows that were on TV when I was a kid. So for the horse, this is a documentary. The other thing is, in all these westerns, they're always cantering off, running off. You know, you run out of energy pretty quick. That's not the way most working horse people move. Um, now we're going to look at, this, in this next clip, we're going to look at horses falling in film. And this one, you're going to see this fellow. He's going to pull the horse's head around, and the horse will fall on its side. This is the better way, I'm not saying it's good, but it's a better way to fall than another way we'll examine later. And I, I will show it, it, you'll see it also in slow motion. And those are all real horses. Oh, and we're looking at racist and sexist westerns, <laughs> too. So it's not just the horses being dominated. Notice he pulls it, its head around and it falls on its side. We see that fall a lot, OK? And we're going to now look at another way that they make horses fall in films, which is called the running W. A rope goes, or a wire, goes from the front to the, uh, the belly to the other front, and then somebody pulls it, and it pulls the front legs down. We see this a lot pre, this was made illegal in, in the 1960. The Humane Society has fought against cruelty in film and TV since 1877. It was only in 1980 that they were officially, when you, we see the notice no animals were harmed, that didn't come till 1980. But this running W was so brutal that they it made it illegal before that. But here's a film made in 1969 that was very popular, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. And here's a, a description of the use of the running W. A difficult and dangerous part of this sequence was getting Paul riding between the horse and the mule across the square. Stars doing their own stunt work is all right up to a point, but it's always risky to let them get into really dangerous physical situations, because if they get hurt, the whole production might have to shut down, waiting for them to get patched up and back to work. But in this case, we had to get some close-ups of him riding between them, and he did them for us. For the wider shots, we were able to use Jimmy Arnett, the uh, Paul's stunt double. 
To get the mule to fall, we used a technique that's illegal in the United States called a flying W. The mule's front feet are wired, and the wires run up through the saddle and out back. The mule gets up a good run, and the wrangler jerks the wires and pulls his front feet out from under him, and he goes over on his face. Uh, there's a chance of breaking the animal's neck in this technique, but fortunately, we didn't. Yeah, so fortunately, they didn't kill the animal. They were filming in Mexico, so it didn't matter that it was illegal in the United States. So one of my questions today is, you know, there, well, uh, there's a show that was just Western filmed in Hungary, what's happening in other countries. Um, but it is, there are better practices. And this is Django Unchained, directed by Quentin Tarantino with uh, Jamie Foxx. They did a lot with horses, and we'll hear some of this. This, again, is them talking about the making of Django Unchained. Very exciting action that you see in the film. But we did it all very safely, and we took the time to do it. You can actually do really amazing, eye-popping things with horses. You just need the time to train them. You need months to train them, to get them ready, to actually be able to do it so they don't get hurt. He keeps alive with this it's wonderful to have that humane sticker. That's why I put it so early uh, in the closing credits. So to relieve audience members, to know that, oh, this was just make-believe. Everything is okay. This was just a fun adventure to watch, and nobody was actually hurt. The, the horses are as important as the people in this because you know, I've always said the, the people have a choice. The horses don't really have a choice. Quentin, he doesn't want to see the tick on the side of the horse get injured. He doesn't want to see a bug crossing the road get run over. He wants what he can get out of everything to a point. And one thing I want you to know, we're going to watch a little clip of them shooting a scene where there's an explosion and a lot of horses fall. You'll see that they all do the side fall and they have trained these horses to do that fall. Sometimes they even put mattresses like on the ground so the horses fall on a mattress. One thing to note when you're watching this is these horses, you'll notice they stand around pretty still while there's all this technical stuff going around. And since horses are prey animals, a uh, horse person I worked with said, troubled minds move feet in a prey animal. And the fact that these horses, when they're just hanging around, aren't you know, doing this uh, means that mentally they're probably a little bit more relaxed, which I think is a reflection of the care this production took. Although I want to say for Quentin Tarantino, put this statement, please, Quentin, I know you're listening, uh, in the front, not in the closing credits. I'd enjoy the film more. All right, we'll watch a little bit of this. So once those horses all charge down the hill, Dennis Wagon has to blow up. 40 explosion. Reading the script, obviously the first thing that popped in my head was how many horses are going to be falling. And Quentin said, you know, it'd be cool to kind of have maybe seven or eight horses fall. And I want it to happen from the explosion. You know, Quentin, he, he wants big shots and he wants them real. So in my head, I'm thinking, okay, I need 15 falling horses because I don't think ever that they'll all go at once. So if he wants seven, I'm going to have 15. If we get seven to go, we're going to be lucky. If eight go, we're more lucky. If 10 go, we're killing it. 14, 14 horses fell. Pass out the torches, please. Light them up. Everybody good? If you need another rehearsal, raise your hand. The rehearsal time was months. I replayed it in my mind a hundred times. And before we started shooting, we did a rehearsal for Quentin. And it literally was all the horses all at the same time, which I've never seen. Nobody has seen that many horses fall at one time. Remember the cadence, three, two, one, action, the explosion at two. We tested it probably five or six times leading up to the night we did it uh, at varying scales, trying to figure out what everybody was going to be happy with. Okay, let's clear out, guys. Quietly, please, for picture. The humane guys were brought in. We talked to them. Everything was approved it, and oh. pretty much went off without a hitch. Ready, three, two, one, go! Now watch the horses don't... That's the actual film. With, but now watch, those horses don't gallop off. 
They trot and then they kind of stop. There were so many people to thank for That's that. remarkable. Now, uh, we're running out of time, and I, we do have a one-minute, um, thank you. We do have a one-minute video. We just want to end watching horses. We want to celebrate boring and watch paint dry, <laughs> watch horses. And, and, but before we go, I'll just mention one thing, is that the horse in a film will tell you how the human is feeling inside. So if the horse is jittery, that means stuff going on inside the horse. Um, I don't have time for these two clips. That's from War Horse. This is from Power of the Dog. Um, but, whoops, yeah. So we're going to, Maddie, if you can come back on, we're going to look at Maddie's herd, and we're just going to spend one minute with some mindfulness, try to stay present, and we're just going to watch horses living a better life. Maddie, are you there? Yes. So, Maddie, who are we looking at here? Uh, so all but uh, all but the one gray horse are rescues, so they have been in um, pretty bad ways before I got them. Uh, they're like like us humans, they're works in progress. Uh, but this is uh, peppermint is the paint. Barry, uh, which you saw at the intro, is the um, bigger gray horse, and then Shay, who's the red horse, is uh, towards the back. In as we look at them now. And then there's a white horse that comes into the frame. Who's that? That's Ray. He is Ray. my only horse that had a really great start in life. <laughs> All right, so we'll just, if you can, just see if we can stay mindfully present watching these horses for one minute. That's the wind. That's our presentation. Thanks, Kari. Thanks, Maddie. Okay, and uh, there's another presentation in a few minutes and a lot going on tonight and tomorrow. Thank you, tech people. Thank you, Creature Conserve and BAI and Talia. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye, Maddie. Bye, Kari. Thank you. Bye, Connie. Bye, Maddie. Thanks, everybody. Bye.